Back with us on the Sportsman Zone. Defending champions West Indies are staring at early elimination from the ICC T20 World Cup after suffering an eight-wicket defeat to South Africa earlier on Tuesday. Ricardo Chambers recaps another horror show by the Windies batsmen. West Indies sent to bat by South Africa, and after a slow start, it was Evan Lewis who found his rhythm. Some repair work done by Evan Lewis. The Trinidadian left-hander struck six sixes and three fours in his top score of 56 from 35 balls. Well connected, and a wonderful half century for Evan Lewis at a critical time. The 29-year-old put on 73 for the first wicket with Lendl Simmons before picking out Kagisa Rabada on the mid-wicket boundary. What a lovely catch. Batting at number three, Nicholas Puran showed glimpses of his class. Back-to-back -back stroke. David Miller advertised his catching quality. Now then, oh, well taken. Oh, that's a good catch. Puran's entertaining stay was brief, gone for 12 from seven. Simmons stalled up for 16 from 35 before Rabada put him out of his misery. Captain Karen Pollard was second top scorer with 26 from 20, while Chris Gale, who came in at four, showed he still has a big hit or two to give. But for the most part, the contributions were not substantial as the Caribbean men labored to 143 for eight, leaving the South Africans 144 to get. In reply, a piece of dreamless brilliance got the Wendy's off to the perfect start. Miss me, I think he's in trouble here. Temba Bavuma gone for two. Risa Hendricks and Rassif van der Dusen made life difficult for the two-time champions, rotating strike and striking big when needed in a 57-run partnership from 50 deliveries. And it needed another piece of fielding brilliance to break them apart. Brilliant catch. Brilliant. Outstanding from Shimon Hetmeyer. But that's all the success the Windies would have. Van der Dusen unbeaten on 43 from 51, while Aidan Markham cracked a brilliant 51 from 26. South Africa winning with 10 deliveries to spare. West Indies losing their first two matches at the T20 World Cup for the first time since the inaugural staging in 2007. Right, so this is the tail of the tape. Evan Lewis, uh, 56, Karen Pollard, 26, the next best scorer. Our Pretorius and Maharaj, uh, three wickets and uh, two wickets respectively. 143 for eight, the win is at a run rate of 7.15. Over the course of the 20 overs, uh, South Africa, they reached their target of 144. With 10 deliveries remaining, they went at 7.85 runs per over. Mark Cram, 51 not out, and Vardar Dussin, 43 not out. The men uh, seeing them home saying one for 27 for the Windies. And so I turn to Fazir Mohammed now for some perspective. Well, before we do that, the Windies fans have been critical of the slow batting of opener Lendl Simmons, who batted 35 balls from only 16 runs. But the Windies skipper, Karen Pollard, feels the team is batting this play overall. was the problem? I'm obviously disappointed. Um, <clears throat> I thought we left about, you know, 20, 25 runs out there when we batted. And, you know, that could have, you know, made a difference in terms of, you know, how we finish off because, you know, we got off to a pretty decent start in terms of, you know, getting that 40 yard in the power play um, without losing a wicket. And that was our opportunity to try to, you know, step a, step a foot on the gas a bit and rotate the strike a bit more and, you know, try to get to that 160. But again, it didn't happen. We got to 143. And I also believe that, you know, my dismissal in that last over, I thought was crucial because we knew that they had over to make up and he was banking on that. But, Again, you know, these things happen and, you know, when things are going a certain way, certain decisions, certain calls, you don't get. So things are going a certain way, according to the Windies skipper. Joining us to discuss the Windies performance and their prospects from here on in are analysts Fazir Mohammed and Cardigan Connor. Good afternoon, Fazir. Good afternoon, Cardi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you and all your, your viewers and listeners. Excellent. Good afternoon, Fazir. Good afternoon, Cardi. Good. Uh, Fazir, I, I, I'll give you first crack. The Windies captain said, you know, certain things not going for the team. If you were to compare and contrast the showing today with that opening show against England, uh, is there anything in, uh, across those two performances to suggest that it can click in the right places for the Windies from here for the remainder of the tournament? First of all, I'm honored to be given first crack with the new ball, given that party <laughs> bowling for so long with the late great Malcolm Marshall. So I feel in really elevated company. <laughs> uh, and secondly, to, to be honest with, with everybody, 
I think the, the story about the West Indies capitulation today is secondary to what Quinton de Kock did in the wider context mm. of sport, but we don't have time. No, 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 we, we're, we're going to get to that, but just not know if you know, Fazir, you, you, you know us very well and know that we are serious people about what we do. There's no way we could not talk about that, but we just wanted to get the bit of the on-field issues out of the way before we dealt with that. Yeah. Fair enough, and, and I appreciate that. And, and I think yeah, if we talk about the West Indies, uh, as, as uh, Karen Pollard alluded to it, calls not going his way, maybe he felt that he was not out, and so on. But that doesn't explain the West Indies basically being on the skid for four matches now. The West Indies lost two warm-up matches, were badly beaten by England, got up uh, 143, which was way below par, despite that good platform. And it was encouraging. But that's like saying that you're leading 1-0 after 30 minutes, and then you forget to play the rest of the game and lose 4-1, and complain about poor calls from the, from the referee and, and, and everybody else. The fact of the matter is the West Indies at the end look a tired, jaded, disillusioned team. Uh, and, and, and at the end of it all, uh, the West Indies, I mean, look at those dismissals, the lack of foot movement, the lack of uh, the, the sort of verve and vitality that you would usually associate, associate with a West Indies T20 team just didn't seem to be there. And whether we, we can, uh, can analyze it till the cows come home, the fact of the matter is on form, the West Indies were always going to be struggling. Uh, we, we, we can be as optimistic as we want. Uh, probably we, we didn't expect the, the, to be in a situation to play too lost to. But this is where we are. And I know, quite frankly, it's very difficult to see the West Indies getting to the semi-final stage with the performances that we've seen over the last few days. Cardi, the, the, the reason many people were pessimistic about the form of the team going in was that they said, well... The warm-up games are supposed to help you to build momentum. No, set, no good momentum was built because they lost both games and they played badly, to be fair. The first two games of this tournament, people are looking around and say, OK, is there anything across the England performance and the performance against South Africa to suggest that it will all come together and fall into place from here? I'm asking if you, with your forensic examination, see anything to suggest that it's all coming into place, it's going to click from the Bangladesh game forward. The problem is that I think the West Indies are not playing as a team, and you have also you have to be consistent. The challenge is that I think the West Indian players in the game before, the first game against England, and this game as well, is that they got out as if they were playing baseball. It's like, like slugging at the ball rather than playing cricket strokes. At the end of the day, there were enough balls left after the start that, that the West Indies had. Sure, Simmons batted slowly, but... The West Indies lacked partnerships once, once uh, Lewis got out. And that was the biggest problem for the West Indies today. And, and unfortunately, what I've seen of the West Indies batting for quite some time suggests that they're not playing cricket strokes, but they're looking for the boundaries or, or the six hits. In fact, that's what even Darren Sammy alluded to in the commentary. And I'm thinking, listen, you, you don't have to, have to hit sixes to win the matches. And the teams that that hits the most sixes doesn't necessarily win the matches. Yeah, and Cardi, you make that point and instantly I think about these press conferences, right? Because when we as the media pose questions to whoever the person is answering them, be it the captain, you know, just random players and whatnot, and we bring up that aspect of the aggressive approach, there seems to be no changing of the tune, as in they're not going to move away from that approach. That's their style. But do you get the sense that this is a team that's not willing to really change anything to get a different result? So they're going out game after game, doing the same thing and expecting different results. Did, did Cardi freeze? It looks, it looks as if he freeze. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to just take the same question and hand it to Faz. Faz, the ball is back with you. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully I'm not frozen by, by your question. But uh, the, the, the fact is that you know, it's, it's, it's all well and good to talk about, you know, that's the way we play. That's our style. And we saw from Lendl Simmons a different way to play, which was entirely what you want. So there, there has to be a happy medium. Are, are we asking for something unreasonable to think that you could find that balance between shot making and accumulation, even in the context T20 cricket match. Is that unreasonable? It would be unreasonable 
if you saw that other teams played the same way the West Indies are playing. But that is not true. What you're seeing now would be other teams, not all, other teams mixing it up well, having far fewer dot balls in, in that regard. And as a result, you see an ability to capitalize on more deliveries than the West Indies are. So the, uh, at the end of the day, the West Indies have been locked into their own modus operandi. It's been shown to be archaic and it's not working right now. And they find it very difficult to get out of it. Yeah, so we have Cardi back with us, Faz, so I'm going to just ask him again. Cardi, you spoke about, you know, the West Indies team not playing as a team. And then I posed the question to you before we lost you. We get the sense that they're not willing to change the aggressive nature. When we speak to them in press conferences, they're sticking with what they know. And I said before we lost you, I don't know if you heard, you know, sometimes you can't just keep doing the same thing and expecting different results. I think the challenge for the West Indian players is that individually fitting into other teams, they've done a terrific job. So, so you find whether, especially in the IPL, the success of Chennai Super Kings and, and also, well, whether it's Mumbai Indians, the West Indian players have had a lot of success because around them they have players that have actually played for the team. But unfortunately, I think for the West Indies uh, right now, uh, the challenge is, is that they're playing as individuals, but not necessarily as a team that will bring success overall. It's not consistent. And when it comes to playing in a tournament, you have to be consistent and not just get lucky on the day. Yeah, and as you mentioned that then instantly, I think about Rostin Chase. He's probably the only player that I can think of right now. And I'm talking about in recent memory, in recent game, in current form. He is the only person that has really been putting up runs. Do you get the sense that he has to play in the next game? Right. And, and again, I think they... they... <laughs> Phrasing. We have you. Go ahead. I, I, again, what I think is, is a case of going into the tournament, you try to duplicate success. And the success that we had at the last World Cup was Marlon Samuels, the role that he played. And around him, the big hitters were able to, to succeed. We're lacking that in this tournament, you know, and, and Ralston Chase went into the World Cup, the form player. Whatever happened in the warm-up games, he obviously did not, wasn't hitting his traps, but at times you have to give people the confidence and the confidence is actually playing the players that you believe can actually produce for you. And again, consistently, and that is with natural batting, as opposed to, to a hit or a miss. And that, that happens too often with the West Indies team. They have not played well together, or consistently well together as a team for quite some time. And I think what happens as well, they will go out in one particular game and, and blast anybody in the world. And that carries them or carries us with them for a period of time. But that does not work going forward. Definitely. Well, gentlemen, you stay with us. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to continue this discussion on the Sportsmax Zone. As we go to the break, which changes would you like to see to the Windies playing 11? We asked that question on WhatsApp and we're looking forward to your voice notes. You're sending it to 564-7661. And of course, our code, we're in Jamaica, it's 1876. We'll be right back. Back with us on the Sports Mag Zone, Cardigan Connor and Fazir Mohammed are with us as we talk about the West Indies and their prospects for the remainder of the T20 World Cup. One wonders for how long will they be here. They have three fixtures to come and uh, their, 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 their fate rests on what happens against Bangladesh and of course what happens beyond that as well. Fazir, uh, given the, the task ahead of the West Indies now is simple, beat Bangladesh and keep those hopes alive. Does this bunch strike you as the kind that will perhaps relinquish the ego that has gotten in front of some of their digital makings and allow themselves to make the adjustments personal-wise and approach-wise that, that are necessary uh, to make their talent come to the fore at a tournament such as this? Well, be before that, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, George, but the, the, the chance of getting this semi-final is already out of the West City's hands, whatever happens in the match against Bangladesh. Because, for example, if England play unbeaten, and South Africa go through the tournament with just that one loss. 
uh, to Australia that first and second, so the West Indies are already out. So, so, so that puts it in context for you. Whether or not it requires a change of personnel, Fletcher for Simmons, Hetmeyer for, for Gale, uh, Ocean Thomas comes in as a, as a strike bowler in place of one of the spinners. Who knows? Uh, we, we, we can all speculate on the option. Obed Mike McCoy comes back into the team. But it, it just seems at the moment, and again, it's not purely because of Saturday's game and today's game. Mm-hmm. What we are seeing is an accumulation of yes. performances which reflect an, an, an inability of the West Indies, as Cardi said, to be consistently successful when it really matters. Yeah, yeah the, 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 you are correct with, with, with what you pointed out at the start of your answer, Fazir. I was only saying that beating Bangladesh, then you can worry about the competitions and what rivals are doing and get your head into that. Lose against Bangladesh, then it doesn't matter what happens. If the sky falls in, you're not going to the next round of the World Cup. But I, I want to say, Fazir, the, 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 the criticism that Lendl Simmons got for his approach to the innings, uh, the players would, would have heard, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure because some of them don't listen, it would seem, that, you know, the getting out to gong-ho shots was being criticized. Could it be that Lendl Simmons was instructed to perhaps play a sheet anchor role in a T20 cricket, which is really not the way that people play T20 cricket. Sheet anchor is good for test cricket and perhaps the 50 over game. And that's what he was trying to do, trying to hold one end while the fireworks happened at the other end. And the other batsman, Evan Lewis, well, and the other batsman really didn't come and do something to make positive the role he was trying perhaps instructed to play at the top of the innings i'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt for here could that be the approach that he took into the game let me give you the award for trying the, your very best to give the, <laughs> get the award for 2021 because Lendl simmons is not 21 years of age Lendl simmons is 56 years of age he's played some spectacular t20 innings 79 against south africa in the 2009 world cup 18 not all India so famously in the semi-finals in 2016 where the West Indies lifted the title. You're talking about a player with vast amount of experience and I find it difficult to accept that he would be instructed to play the anchor role to such an extent that it would amount to strokelessness for much of his innings. It, it can't be that. It can't be. It, it, you've got to... One of the, the, the elements of elite level anything whether you're an elite level cricketer, footballer, or carpenter, is the ability to adapt to the situation and the circumstances. And that's what separates the, the ordinary from the very good. And so, Edward Simmons, for quite a long time, has been very good. Why he would play at innings like that today? And I, I appreciate that Karen Pollard said, well, he didn't want to put anybody under the bus when he was questioned about it by Mark Nicholas at the end of the game. But it's, it's difficult to fathom. Lendl Simmons' tactics. Yeah, yeah, perhaps defenseless. I, I tried my best there. Let's get to the big issue, gentlemen. I'm itching to talk about that because we, 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 we can accept that the Windies are dead insofar as a semi-final berth is concerned. Like you, Fazir, I was most troubled by the report emerging about Quinton de Kock's absence from that South Africa team. I knew that the Cricket South Africa directive overnight would perhaps have some repercussions. Never would I have imagined that the repercussion would have been in the form of Quinton de Kock saying that he would rather sit in the stands than take the knee as mandated by Cricket South Africa. And I, I, I want to, 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 to ask you, gentlemen, if, we, well, was de Kock right to stand on principles that he obviously believes in? And we are in the age where everybody's rights have to be affected. Did Cricket South Africa miss time the issuing of the mandate as the captain Temba Bovuma suggested in his post-match comments? What do we make of all of this? I'll start with you, Fazir. Uh, uh, let me put it this way. I would hope that Quinton de Kock has just played his last match for South Africa a couple of days ago because we are talking about South Africa. We are not talking about even the UK with their history of exploitation and colonialism and so on. We're talking about a country that still to this day experiences issues of racism and the consequences of apartheid. And to have a player basically say that I prefer not to play for my country rather than take a knee. And, and, and again, the question I would ask to all of those who would be saying, what is the point of taking a knee? What is this, what is this all about? I bow only to God or whatever it is and all, all of that sort of thing. Why is it so offensive if other people have agreed, people of color, the real victims here, 
Because anyone who pretends that people of African descent globally are not discriminated against generally, that the darker your, your skin tone, as in India, determines your fate in, in, in many, many cases. People, if people want to pretend, that's fine. No problem whatsoever. But what is so offensive, even if you were told 30 seconds before you walk on the field, you know what? We're going to be in solidarity with the West Indies by taking a knee. Let's take a knee. What is the problem? Is it that you are so offended at the concept of identifying with something that you don't identify with, that it, it, it disturbs you to the core that you choose not to represent your country? Mark Boucher shouldn't be anywhere near a South African team after what was revealed in those hearings in South Africa some time ago about how they ridiculed colored players when he was part of the South African team. There's a lot to come out of this, but I suspect, given white dominance, white privilege when it comes to the international game and international sport generally, a tremendous effort is going to be made to water down what we saw today. Cardi, bad optics, the white man opting not to, 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 to join in the team gesture to support the anti-racist movement. I was very disappointed. And in fact, the truth was when I saw he was not in the lineup, I was quite pleased. But then very disappointed as to why he was not what in the lineup. And, and again, it is a case of when teams come together. I've played internationally in England and Australia. And the truth is, is that your teammates, you see them as part of a family. That's how, how really success comes within a team. And to have a player of the Cox statue, who's actually captain South Africa, you know, at the, the 2020 level, for him to take this particular stance at this point in time was very disappointing. But again, what it says is that that for the black players in the team, it, it says a lot about Bavuma as captain. We've always seen uh, how Rabada, his enthusiasm and, and how what he feels about being a black man playing in the South African team, not because of his color, but because of his ability. South African's cricket, I believe, has come a long way. But still, at the end of the day, it is still made up of the attitude of some of the players within the team. If, if you ask me, if I was South African, I would say, play the rest of the tournament without him. Well, well that's what they've set out to do, Mariah, because they've said that the, the mandate will remain for the entire tournament. Yeah, and you know, Faz said something that really stuck with me just now, and I want to hear if Cardi feels the same. Faz said that, you know, he see that this will just be basically brushed over, watered down, because, you know, they're going to just go through it as if nothing massive happens. And I actually feel as if, you know more players might want to come out now because he said he's a T20 captain and follow his suit. Well, at, at the end of the day, I think it, it is about what Cricket South Africa stands for. And when we talk about solidarity, I, we have to, the, internationally, I think the, the ICC has to come in and play a role in this as well. It is not just about one individual from the South African team. In fact, as Fazir mentioned that what Boucher did in his day, I think at the time they had extra privileges. Those privileges are not afforded to them at this point in time. They dominated South African cricket at that point in time. And what has happened internationally in the field of sports has said that there's a greater responsibility to you as an individual when you are presenting a nation, and especially a nation where the majority are black players. Of, of black citizens. So internationally, I think whether it's India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan and the likes, New Zealand, I know generally have been very supportive of the black cause over the years. And I would like to think that they too would look to put some pressure, not just on their players, but internationally who plays with or against them. Gentlemen, let, let, let's hurry through two more talking points before we finish this, 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 this um, discussion. Fazir, the black Crystal Palace star Wilfried Zaha talking about the English Premier League doesn't take the knee because he says look taking the knee will not advance the cause of racial equality and racial justice in the UK he said he has been a victim many times over of the racism that sparked the BLM movement in the first place and he just believes that taking the knee is a waste of time some people will say well look 
Wilfried Zaha, a black man, has that stance and he doesn't take the knee. Why are we coming down like a ton of bricks on Quinton de Kock for his stance at the World Cup T20 earlier today? Because the issue is, George, about standing up against racism. Wilfried Zaha is free to do whatever he wants because if people are thinking that this is going to solve a centuries-old issue in the space of a few weeks or because Michael Holding advocated it or whatever, then they need to get their head out of the Instagram age or the TikTok age. It doesn't happen in 17 seconds. It doesn't happen in the time of a TED Talk, 18 minutes. It takes a concerted effort. And just on that point about taking the lead, whether you identify it with it or not, whether you see it as an American thing, whether you, whether you see it as Colin Kaepernick of the San Francisco 49ers and his creation or whatever, if it is that it has been determined that this is a way to make normal that the issue of race is a primary concern so that when you walk in the ground and they take a knee, it becomes as normal as a handshake. So it reminds you of the issue of race. I think what people are thinking is that somebody takes a knee and we all start crying and hugging each other up and begging for forgiveness. That is not going to happen. It is going to take years, decades and generations. And if from now you're having people basically openly ignoring that, and especially from a country like South Africa with its racist history and a white person at that doing it with, almost with impunity, it tells you how far we have to go with this. But Cardi, another question for you, because here's the thing. What about the management exhibited by South, Cricket South Africa over the issue? Because they must have known that passions were high among certain players within the squad where they're taking the knees concerned because the mandate was born of the mishmash of approaches uh, to taking the knees. Some, pe some players stood, some people knelt and raised their fists, some, people didn't, some pe players didn't acknowledge it. So they said, you know what, a mandate is necessary. Given that you would have known which players may not may defy this mandate, why not from the start of the tournament, and this tournament started several days ago, why not meet with the players, institute that mandate then, so you could use the time in between that and the first game of the tournament to manage the reaction, so maybe Mr. Lecoq could have been saved from embarrassing himself and embarrassing his country, especially with its history. I'm looking at Cricket Out South Africa, and wondering if they couldn't have done better, Cardi. Yeah, very good point. I suppose in hindsight, they could have done a better job, but... They've reached a stage where they felt they want to be unified. And the best way to be unified was to have one stance. And the stance right now that is it's international and universal is actually the knee. And the knee means a lot. It, it means that, again, the challenges that were faced, Colin Kaepernick, I give him all the praise uh, there is. He suffered for it. But I think what you find right now in the NFL that that throughout the NFL, he is regarded in very high esteem. You had issues there with, with the owners of the clubs who probably resented that. In fact, you had a president of the United States who many things was very racial, and he resented that. But I think for, for cricket South Africa, they've got their challenges off the field socially. But what I would say today, despite all that was going on with them, they came out on top today, and they played like a team. If you didn't know that, they had those issues in the background because it was not reflected on the field. As opposed to the West Indies going into the first game, we brought comments that were made by Ambrose onto the field of play, which worked against us. Yeah, yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your time. Quinton de Kock has decided to end his tournament early, and based on his reason for doing so, I don't think any of us will miss him. Thank you very much for your time, gentlemen. All the best. Take care. Good, good. For Thank Muhammad you. Thank you. And Cardigan Connor there. Coming up, Kevin Durant celebrates another milestone. We recap the action from Monday night's NBA play. Also, Southampton left. Were they singing the blues or crying the blues in today's Carmel Cup? And it's official, you know, schoolboy football to return in Jamaica, even as the vaccination debate rages in the background.